Okay, we have already learned acute renal failure, right? Acute tubular necrosis, acute kidney injury leading to acute renal failure, isn't it? Yes, acute tubular necrosis is similar to acute kidney and will ultimately lead to acute renal failure. Okay, then again we will discuss the difference between acute renal failure and chronic renal failure after completing this renal vascular disease. Is are synonymous. If you remember, those were synonymous. Acute kidney injury, acute tubular necrosis, one lead to other. That's why it is partially synonymous. So be aware of that. Now coming to renal vascular disease. The renal vascular disease include involvement of renal vasculature because of either primary hypertension or secondary hypertension or renal infarction because of obstructive or ischemic disorders okay obstruction to blood supply or by the thromboembolic event or by some other process isn't it and then thrombotic microangiopathies different microangiopathies that involve renal vasculature okay so these include renal vascular disease now how the kidney manifest in renal vascular disease either there will be benign nephrosclerosis or there will be malignant nephrosclerosis so first comes benign nephrosis benign means the pores is not deadly here we are not talking about neoplasm benign or malignant we are not talking about neoplasm it is the pores of these thromboembolic events or um, uh, say hypertension or whatever the vascular disease the kidney is involved, the pores will be benign or not deadly. So usually benign nephrosclerosis occurs in patients who are hypertensive, who are usually elderly, more than 60 years. And, uh, uh, what are the gross and microscopic pictures? As per curriculum, we are supposed to know the gross and microscopic pictures. So I have just summarized it and not elaborated it. Okay. The clinical implication is also to know the gross and microscopy and radiological uh, morphology so that we can know that a patient is undergoing nephrosclerosis or not. So even in USC or CT or MRI, the kidney will be smaller. And if the kidney and nephrectomy happen to be done, so there will be small contracted kidney in benign nephrosclerosis, which is usually reserved from long-term benign hypertension. Okay. Have you uh, studied malignant hypertension in cardiovascular system? Okay, so you know what are the criteria of malignant hypertension. Can you mention once? And systemic blood pressure is above or equal to 200 millimeter. What is? What are the other associated findings? There will be fibrinoid necrosis. Okay, in malignant hypertension, the BP goes very high persistently and there will be Fibrinoid necrosis. All right. Okay. In benign nephrosclerosis, the patient is usually aged, the kidney is smaller, contracted, and the surface is granular. And there will be scars of ischemia. All right. There will be V separate scars. Morphologically, what will uh, be seen is there will be arteriosclerosis, high line arteriosclerosis of the vasculature of the kidney. The because of the smooth muscle proliferation over course of time, there will be thickening of the intima. The intima, media, and adventuria are three layers of the blood vessels. So there will be intimal thickening in uh, blood vessels. What will uh, intimal thickening do? They will narrow the caliber of the blood vessel. So there will be hypoperfusion of the subsequent tissues. Okay. Apart from the vasculature, there will be tubular atrophy and fibrosis. So you can see the small contracted kidney with the v shaped scars. This is the picture of when I, the surface is quite granular. Can you notice the surface is granular? Now here you can see the intimal thickening and highline arteriosclerosis. The blood vessel is the one of the blood vessels is replaced by highline tissue. There is a homogeneous eosinophilic wall. Isn't it? This is past system homogeneous eosinophilic wall is there. Alright? This is past stain which particularly stains past means periodic acid shift stain. PAS, we stain for the blood vision wall and the past and the other proteins. So here you can see the inner layer of vessel is quite thickened. 
and the tubular wall is also thickened. The uh, blood vessel is literally thickened. Okay, quite broad, isn't it? What is malignant nephrosclerosis? It is. It occurs in the course of malignant hypotension. Grossly, the kidney is flea bitten. Okay, the kidney appears as if it is bitten by flea. And unlike the benign nephrosclerosis, it is enlarged and edematous with particular hemorrhage because of that flea bitten appearance. While in benign nephrosclerosis, the kidney was small, granular, contracted, and there were V shaped scars. Okay. And in microscopy, there will be necrotizing, not necrotizing, it is necrotizing arteriolitis. While in benign, there was only intimal thickening and hyalinosis or hyaline changes. Isn't it? Here, there will be necro necrosis, fibrinoid necrosis. So we also call necrotizing arteriolitis. The small vessels go undergo necrosis. There will be onion skin appearance of the blood vessel along with the ischemic changes. Now you see here the skin appearance of flea bitten skin and compare the kidney. Can you compare the? Are you able to see the pictures? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So just compare the petechial hemorrhage beneath the renal capsule. All right, and compare it with the skin appearance. There are small small petechial hemorrhage because of the. A bite of the insect and that's why it is not flea bitten and in compared to benign nephrosis the kidney is rather enlarged edematous glistening because of the capsule is stretched all right because of enlargement of kidney so this is flea bitten, flea -bitten appearance of enlarged edematous kidney and here uh, because there was highline changes in benign nephrosis the appearance was homogeneous isn't it? There was homogeneous thickening of intima and there was homogeneous uh, material accumulation means hyaline change was there. Here you can compare the onion skin appearance. It is concentric uh, hypertrophy of the blood vessel valve. Alright? There is concentric hypertrophy of intima media involving both and that a particular appearance is known as onion peel appearance of the arterioles. Here from the picture, the blood vessels are getting concentrically thickened, hypertrophic. Okay. Are you able to see the picture? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. So what are the causes of malignant hypertension or malignant sorry malignant Nephrosclerosis or flea bitten kidney. Sometimes we ask in uh, MCQ in what condition you see flea bitten appearance in the kidney. So it occurs, this malignant nephrosclerosis occurs in the context of malignant hypertension first because it is renal vascular disease. All right. Then sometimes it also occurs in the course of rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. Whatever it or wherever it occurs, it occurs in acute conditions like malignant hypertension does not persist for long. Either the patient will die or will have to manage and uh, bring the temperature, sorry, blood pressure back to near normal, isn't it? So malignant hypertension cannot persist for longer. While benign hypertension may uh, go unnoticed, okay, patient may be tolerating it and sometimes patient uh, live with this uh, hypertension for a long time. There is already changes in kidney and that's why there is nephrosclerosis, a small contracted kidney. So one of the causes, malignant hypertension, which is acute cause. Some other acute causes are rapidly progressive. See the name, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, acute post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. That is acute condition, occurs within a few weeks. Okay, pan-arteritis nodosa is, P-A-N, pan-arteritis nodosa is one of the arterialitis, arterial disease, inflammatory arterial disease, also known as vasculitis. Okay, that vasculitis causes thickening of the wall, concentric enlargement of the wall, narrowing of the blood vessel, ischemia, and so on, and damaging the kidney. Then thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or hemolytic uremic syndrome, which occurs in the context of uh, end stage diseases or any sepsis or any disease uh, that is going to be terminated, or henoxpondic purpura. Is another form of vasculitis. So all these diseases can be associated with flea-bitten uh, flea kidney. 
we here we are discussing in the context of this malignant nephrosclerosis why there is only an pill appearance because of hypercarstic arteriosclerosis there is concentrated hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the blood vessels and this uh, differential dynamics are just to skip that we get make you confused i just want you to know the normal that arteriosclerosis see in benign there was arteriosclerosis that was highlighted means this is endothelium and beneath the endothelium sub endothelial highlight material was accumulated but in hyperplastic what happens there is concentric enlargement of this contains the components of the blood vessel wall okay so uh, wait so this is this is about renal vascular disease now yes we will now again go back to uh, renal failure overall till now we have talked about atn or acute kidney injury that has given you idea that this will ultimately give, uh, lead to acute renal failure isn't it so with the background okay uh, with the background of this renal diseases let's just start the discussion again about the renal failure Uh, these general diseases for the discussion purpose are divided into glomerular disease, tubular disease, and gestational and basal disease. What we just now we started our general chapters with glomerular disease. We went through pylori arthritis and all that is tubular disease or uh, interstitial disease and renal basal disease. That is benign and malignant nephrosclerosis. Basically, there are many other conditions, but here we are discussing about that. now uh, most of the glomerular disease tend to be immunologically mediated while this tubular and interstitial disease are associated with infections or toxins the toxins may be drugs or some exogenous toxins okay and these uh, diseases are interchangeable in the meaning that glomerular and tubular disease affect each other if this glomerular disease will affect tubule if there is tubular disease they will affect glomeruli because they have their proximal arrangement isn't it so basically what happens glomerular disease impairs the tubular blood supply and uh, tubular toxins will uh, damage the glomeruli by increasing intraglomerular pressure now we uh, have talked about this getting the idea of nephritic syndrome if there are gross hematuria associated hypotension azotemia oliguria proteinuria and all those things we say it is nephritic syndrome and there are certain diseases that are responsible for that now ultimately all these diseases say like acute nephritic syndrome or uh, the disease responsible for that like post infectious glomerular nephritis or membranic proliferative or whatever or pyelonephritis interstitial vascular whatever diseases the kidney is involved the ultimate chance is of renal failure so you have to understand what is renal failure the normal function of kidney is to produce urine to filter uh, the waste materials to excrete the waste material to purify the blood and form urine now any disease any disease that affects the renal parenchyma whether primary or secondary ultimately in the complicated cases or treated cases or in the progressive condition will lead to renal failure the uh, kidney will not form urine there will be no gfr Okay, the measure of urine formation is basically glomerular filtration rate. So there will be no GFR, and symptomatically there will be only urea or anuria. Now coming back about renal failure. So uh, the concept is renal. Sorry. Yes. So the concept about the renal failure is it is of two types: acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. and there are terms azotemia and uremia okay so acute renal failure is associated with azotemia azotemia means because of the failure of kidney or the different diseases of kidney there will be uh, accumulation of increased blood urea nitrogen and increased serum creatinine why because gfr is reduced so these metabolites which has to be excreted which are supposed to be excreted and get excreted in the normal conditions are building up in the serum plasma or blood so there will be acute acute means it is sudden onset abrupt onset and it is rapidly progressive so if there is abrupt oliguria or anuria with rapid, rapidly progressive azotemia 
again i am revising the definition of azotemia is increased blood urea nitrogen or increase uh, and or increased serum creatinine due to reduced gfr because the urine output is reduced okay and the cause can be different it can be kidney cause or prenatal cause or postural cause and last class also i said just like hepatic disease we classify the causes as prenatal renal and postural because ultimately the kidney is affected whether the disease is not primarily intrarenal okay and this renal failure is broadly divided into acute and chronic now what is chronic renal failure if that azotemia which happen during acute phase progresses to uremia okay progresses to uremia over period of months or years then it is called chronic renal failure now again you have to understand what is that uremia then so uremia is azotemia plus clinical features okay not only clinical features all other clinical features so azotemia plus clinical sign and symptoms are known as uremia very simply to understand there are many uh, criteria for uremia and what are the causes of uremia it can occur uh, uh, what are the diseases that are associated with uremia so all pre renal renal and post renal cause that these to renal failure can cause uremia now what are the signs and symptoms or what are the clinical manifestation there are many like the patient will develop uremic gastroenteritis uremic peripheral neuropathy uremic pericarditis secondary hyperparathyroidism and all because of the association with chronic renal failure chronic renal failure or chicken uh, chronic kidney disease ultimately azotemia and uremia and uremia is uh, involving many other organs there are multi organ pathology right and if the defect is tubular there will be because the function of tubule is concentration of urine so there will be polyuria as well as nocturia and because of that there is electrolyte disorder okay so tubular defect usually leads to polyuria and uh nocturia now again i said the concept is that the disease is the bio curriculum says from concept stages and pathology and all so i have made slide according to that so uh, the concept is that the kidney failure can be acute kidney failure or chronic uh, chronic kidney failure the acute uh, kidney failure will be of sudden onset and rapidly progression chronic uh, kidney disease or chronic kidney failure will be over time and will be gradually progressing the other names are just renal failure it can be acute to chronic and the acute kidney failure is associated with acute tubular necrosis So all the causes of acute tubular necrosis are causes of acute, um, acute kidney failure, also known as acute kidney injury, and all. Okay, and the chronic kidney disease, the last stage is known as end stage renal disease. Causes of acute and chronic vary. Like in acute, if there is low blood pressure, now how the low blood pressure will cause acute kidney failure? When we are saying that malignant hypertension, which is high blood pressure. causes acute kidney injury and acute renal failure and malignant uh, malignant hepatosis and all no blood pressure means patient is in shock there is no blood pressure very hypoperfusion of the tissue including renal tissue the renal tissue are not getting perfused if you remember i said the acute tubular necrosis which leads to acute kidney failure has basic two causes what were they up sir ischemia and toxic So ischemic cause. Ischemia happens when there is no blood supply. No blood supply can result from obstruction or low blood pressure or hypovolemic shock or any other type of shock. In that way, we are saying no blood pressure as the cause of acute kidney failure. Then blockage of urinary tract. The blockage of tract can be physical, can be functional, can be uh, like uh, within the tube, uh, urinary tract or from the outside, intrinsic or extrinsic. Okay. Then medications, the nephrotoxic drugs. Okay. Then muscle breakdown. If there is myoglobinuria or hemoglobinuria, all those uh, things will cause build up in uh, over the kidney overload and renal failure. And then hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is end result of sepsis. Now, if you see uh, uh, chronic causes, the cause of chronic is opposite high blood pressure, persistent high blood pressure. Then some kidney diseases like nephrotic syndrome or polycystic kidney disease, which can be carried on in a chronic city. Diabetes, yes, diabetes, glomerulus cirrhosis, is or diabetic nephropathy is one of very important cause of chronic kidney disease. Okay. 
we have already discussed about acute renal failure in different way the causes and the consequences the uremia the azotemia now let's concentrate a little bit on chronic uh, renal failure so uh, there is national kidney foundation which have a guidelines so that the physicians who are involved in the treating the kidney disease can categorize their patient okay so there are overall five stages of disease in first stage there is renal insert but gfr is almost normal or high and it is usually more than 90 ml per minute what is normal gfr anyone 125 ml per minute okay, great so 120 or 125 ml per minute so here the gfr is within normal range uh, that is it is more than 90 Then stage two is mild CKD. Mild CKD there is which is less than ninety but sixty or more. So there is gap of thirty. Just less than ninety but sixty or more. So sixty to ninety is stage two. So everything is on the basis of GFR. Then stage three. Stage three is from thirty to sixty and it is again divided into three uh, A and three B. So forty five to sixty is three uh, A and 30 to 45 is 3b and if the gfr is 15 to 30 means less than 30 uh, 15 to less than 30 then it almost stays 4 and in stage 5 if gfr is less than 50 ml per minute <coughs> so these are the stages okay and the respective gfr so starting from 90 or above to less than 50 as the gfr decreases the kidney disease progresses all right and stage one is characterized by mild kidney damage and the kidney function is almost 90% restored means the gfr is more than 90 and the percentage of kidney functioning is also more than 90 stage two there is some uh, loss of kidney function that is that has started and it ranges from 60 to 90 and so on as i we just said okay they are all same more than 90 to less than 50% and this a this stage renal disease means patient has uh, almost crossed stage 4 and is stage 5 okay so these days we don't use the term renal failure acute or chronic for acute we say uh, acute kidney injury or acute tubular necrosis Okay, usually this renal failure term is uh, because it uh, goes on only with stage five. So we say any stage renal disease. Renal failure terms are rarely used these days. Okay, now what is this any stage renal disease or chronic kidney disease? The synonym is chronic kidney disease. It is irreversible and progressive reduction of functioning renal tissue, functioning of renal tissue. Okay, the kidney may be of normal size or contracted or smaller. But overall, the function is progressively reduced, and it is irreversible. By uh, suppose by taking out the cause, we cannot reward the function of the kidney. Okay, and if the abnormalities can be structural abnormalities or functional abnormalities, and that persists for more than three months. Okay, whether uh, the, the GFR is affected or not. Okay. The stages of CKD, their uh, classification, as I said, when it's the kidney uh, and central guidelines. So this kidney failure, renal failure, these all are uh, same words. They are synonymous. They are in this condition, the kidney is not able to excrete the metabolic products and water. So there is only urea and anuria and accumulation of those waste products. So what will happen? Because of accumulation, there will be azotemia. First, there will be blood urea nitrogen uh, will be accumulated, or serotonin or creatinine will go higher. And if that is present with other complications, that we see syndrome, that is uremic syndrome. All right. And just like acute kidney injury syndrome, uh, the, uh, even acute kidney injury leading to acute renal failure is given a name of. syndrome okay there is azotemia so i hope you understood the difference between acute and chronic the acute has pre renal renal and post renal causes we have already discussed if something is confusing you can go through this slides i will not uh, revise again and again but you can understand that in acute condition it is sudden okay it is sudden and 
there are some of the causes like hypovolemia the hypocausis of hypovolemia can be fluid loss in the form of diarrhea dysentery vomiting that will cause uh, dehydration blood loss because of some trauma isn't it or sun or some hemorrhagic diseases and then excessive diuresis it can be pathological or can be therapeutic because of antihypertensive and all uh, or diabetes insipidus or it can cause excessive diuresis then hypoalbuminemia burns burns also causes loss of fluid so all these lead to hypovolemia and the acute kidney injury so uh, other uh, things in prenatal causes that is not pertaining to kidney are peripheral vascular resistance disease that occurs in shock especially septic septic shock and anaphylaxis and decrease in renal vascular flow because of the vein uh, arterial or venous obstruction by thrombosis embolism and hepatorenal syndrome similarly so uh, i hope you have understood the pathophysiology from many uh, classes we are discussing same thing because of all these etiological factors the volume is reduced the renal flow is reduced renal perfusion is compromised the gfr is decreased okay and there is azotemia now notice that in acute the renal um, um, structural damage is not much the kidney size is not altered the structural damage is not much the functional damage this can be with the time the management can be restored okay there are no as such consequences the patient survives but in kidney it persists for a long time for more than 3 months and the kidney size and uh, the function and the parenchyma is lost and that is irreversible okay so uh, intrarenal cause can be ischemic and nephrotoxic or interstitial diseases the nephrotoxic uh, i hope you know the nephrotoxic drugs can you mention some nephrotoxic drugs gentamicin what else the common one um, tetracyclines yes tetracyclines tetracyclines all right more common um, okay all the drugs are metabolized they are somewhere uh, harmful to kidney okay all the drugs they are metabolized in kidney so they are harmful to the but some drugs are labeled as nephrotoxic okay some are labeled as ototoxic some are uh, labeled as nephrotoxic like that so one of the important group is aminoglycosides streptomycin yes streptomycin comes under aminoglycoside streptomycin is the first drug uh, second line drug that uh, first time it was used as anti tubercular therapy att because of this it is very good drug streptomycin has very good cure rate for many infections including tuberculosis but because of its nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity it, it go went to the second line drug rather than first line okay then some uh, contrast media like we are doing intravenous spirogram or, or, or any other contrast agent we are injecting so that we was ultimately excreted to kidney isn't it so uh, that can cause renal damage like, then blood transfusion reaction if there is hemolysis there will be Globinuria, myoglobinuria that will overload the kidney and there will be kidney damage, all right? And many other chemical exposures and cross injury. If the muscle or bone or any cross injury is there, road traffic accident, so that also causes um, muscle cross injury will cause myoglobinuria and that will uh, cause renal overload. And certain anaphylactic reactions, certain allergies, food allergies, or drug allergy, or some other insect bite allergy. Uh, I have already told in one of the lecture that I have myself seen a case of nephrotic syndrome that result from bee sting, and the patient really um, had bad times. I, I don't know that patient permanently recovered or not. Okay, uh, it did, uh, came to me to it did come to me to for follow up, but till uh, I was attending the case, it was in bad shape. So even the allergies can cause nephrotoxicity, renal failure, and even can challenge our lives. Okay. Uh, other intrarenal causes can be acute glomerulonephritis, prolonged prenatal ischemia. From don't forget thromboembolism in the context of ischemia, ischemic injury. Even pregnancy, the toxemia, pregnancy, malignant hypotension, systemic leukocyte. But there are so many causes. Okay, if you classify the causes in prenatal, renal, and postnatal, you can. somewhere you can uh, mention many important points so always classify it that way the 
post renal cause are almost obstructive. Remember, post whether it is about post renal or post hepatic in the liver failure, the causes are usually obstructive. And where is the obstruction? Beyond kidney, and that means the tract, the urinary tract. Okay, so there can be BPS, the uh, bladder hypertrophy, bladder cancer, calculi, neuromuscular disorders, or chronic uh, urinary bladder. Okay, there is stasis. Okay. And then strictures, trauma, all those things. Post renal cause are usually obstructive. So, what will they do? They will cause mechanical obstruction of our flow of urine. The urine goes back, there is deflux, and that will cause hydrodefosis, increased pressure, and tubular blockage, and progressive kidney failure. Okay? Now, uh, in clinical manifestation, we are just going through renal failure. So, sometimes acute, sometimes maybe. So, in acute, uh, the phases are, uh, I have already told, first is after onset there will be oliguric phase and then comes the diuretic phase. This, uh, there will be polyuria. We have already discussed it again, kidney injury, again revising it. So in onset phase, the triggering event, there will be features of the respective disease, like if it is dehydration, the cause of dehydration, if it is sepsis, the cause of sepsis. In that way, there will be uh, in triggering event will be there, the onset phase, and that will be in couple of hours days in acute condition. In the oliguric phase, it uh, occurs over one or two weeks, and the, uh, there is oliguria means the urine output is less than 400 ml, and uh, if it is beyond uh, less than 100 ml, it goes in anuria. So anuria, the oliguric event will occur, and that will lead to buildup of urea nitrogen and creatinine and electrolyte disturbance will also be occurred that can be metabolic acidosis. And once the GFR is, um, say, meant, uh, if the, uh, the disease is addressed and once uh, the GFR is maintained or sometimes it is increased, okay, so initially the kidney will try to adapt and there will be hyperfiltration. The glomerulite is just filtering 120 ml per minute or 125 ml per minute now it drink more okay not as a part of pathology but as a part of adaptation it is trying to compensate the loss of the remaining nephrons so what will happen because of that there will be increased glomerular permeability and there will be filtration of some proteins and molecules that is not normally filtered so there will be proteinuria there will be dyslipidemia at the same time the uh, oxidative stress will be increased okay there will be radian angiotensin as the system activated that will cause inflammation and remodeling. So ultimately what will happen will be tumular interstitial fibrosis and secondary post-segmental glomerular sclerosis. All these things will ultimately lead to decreased GFR, decreased urinary output and azotemia. Oliguria and urea will cause azotemia. And what will azotemia cause? Uremia. Azotemia when it uh, manifest with the sign and symptoms, there will be uremia, there will be systemic uremic complications. And ultimately, in the end stage renal disease, uh, no drug works, no treatment works. So, what uh, we need is we need is, we need is renal replacement. We want uh, we need substitute of kidney. Therapeutically, we need because functioning parenchyma of kidney is lost. Kidney is there, it is small, contracted, and there are some nephrons, but non functioning. So, sometimes the diagnosis is made clinically is non functioning kidney, and then they do nephron. So, we send those to the pathology department. We study, and sometimes the cause is pyelonephritis, sometimes it is arteriosclerosis, okay, sometimes it is some other uh, kidney disease like focal cell mental glomerular sclerosis because of diabetes. So, we pathologists classify it, find out the cause, what happened over the months and years that lead to this kidney failure, chronic kidney disease, CKD, non functioning kidney. Now, how can we do real replacement therapy? One is kidney transplantation itself. We can replace the non functioning kidney by a functioning kidney from a donor whose actually matches or uh, everything matches. Another is dialysis. The dialysis is of two types. You might have heard about dialysis when you go to hostel. There is a dialysis center in our hospital, isn't it? Do you know dialysis? Okay, so yeah. dialysis, the function that is performed by kidney will be performed by a artificial membrane within a machine. These are two types: peritoneal dialysis, which can be done in household setting, uh, a little trained 
patient party, family members can perform uh, with the aseptic and antiseptic measures because it has to be done almost daily. So not possible to bring the patient every day. So it can be done in uh, at home also. Everyone has to be trained from the nursing staffs or doctors how to handle all those things. Another is hemodialysis in which a fistula, arterial venous fistula is made in her veins, hand or foot and uh, the, uh, that fistula is connected to a dialysis machine and entire blood is filtered from that machine. The, uh, the blood is, has to be filtered in kidney normal situation. Like our uh, blood is continuously getting filtered every minute. Isn't it? Our GFR is continuing 125 ml per minute is going on and we are not doing anything. But when the kidney is disease, there is use mechanism to do and that hemodialysis is so cumbersome, the patient has to be hospitalized and uh, has to go through many invasive procedures. So we should be very much careful about our kidney. We should love our kidney. We should drink plenty of water, avoid infections, especially UTI. We should not, even in young ages, even in your ages, we have seen cases of hypertension. So it is hypertension, I'm just young, it doesn't matter, no. You should address it, you should get treated. The cause may be anxiety, maybe something non-specific, and uh, which is because of anxiety, no, don't uh, ignore, because it is harming your kidney, okay? So kidney should be cured very nicely, all right? That's it for today. Thank you so much. Now we are left. With Thank you. We are left with tumors of kidney, urinary bladder pathologies, and SLE. We have already done urine analysis. We are done with the chapters like glomerular nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, acute tubular necrosis, renal failure, pyelonephritis, nephrosclerosis, hydronephrosis, renal calculi, polycystic kidney, and disease in general. So you also see curriculum if something is left and in next three classes we'll finish kidney and we'll start endocrine. I think endocrine is already started in other systems.